and I looked, and behold, the heavens were opened. A ninth season. <laughs> we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the five solas. We believe in the doctrines of grace. A lot of the time, people are asking the wrong questions. They're not asking the questions like, do I understand God's grace? Do I understand the cross? Every single one of us has our own ministry. It doesn't matter if you work as a CEO or you work at McDonald's or whatever you do, or whether you're quote unquote in ministry, you have a ministry. As we mature, we walk, it, we, we enjoy our relationship with God in as much as we see his majesty in the blessings that we have just by what Yeshua has done for us, not by what we have done to impress God and then get something from him. So, fa- but, so, so salvation by faith. Absolutely. Salvation by faith. I keep zeroing in on these, you know, the big ideas. Like, what is biblical love? You know, what is what is grace? Do I have an accurate understanding of God's grace? Our love for Yeshua, but His love, like, through us, is why we're doing what we're doing. And that's why it's called Messiah Matters. Day, June 22nd. This is Messiah Matters number 391. Like Rob, normally I have not prepared anything to say. My name is Caleb Pegg. Wow. Well, I was going to say uh, happy summer solstice. <laughs> ah. Except, except I, th- I don't think it's today. I think it was like yesterday or the day before. It was yesterday, yep. Yep. So I guess I can't do that. I'm Rob Van Huff. So we have had some interesting interaction in the past couple uh, couple of days here, and what happened was for those who don't well before okay before I jump in, let's just say, uh, actually let me do this. I can't forget our producers. We have a new producer credit. Nice. Actually, this is the this is the first thing that we that we should get to before we jump into the 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 drama that has taken that has ensued in the past couple of days. Um. First of all, we have what has become, in the past week, my favorite producer mug that we've ever produced. And when I say we, I mean Mike. Our wonderful graphic artist has produced a wonderful mug for us. It is the it is a play on the Domino's Pizza mug. You can get it now. Go to, uh, go to TorahResource.com, uh, hover over store, go down to Other Materials, find the producer credit for the summer. It is dynamite. Uh, and we want to say thank you to all of our producers. Here we go. There are our producers for this summer time, those who have signed up already. And we have a new producer, uh, Bobby, I think I'm saying this right, Keichner. I could be wrong, uh, in York, PA. And he, he wrote in a little message. Now, I, let me get my soundboard up here. He did not request any sound bites, but that's Okay. Uh, we'll try to pick some for him if my computer doesn't crash here as we open up uh, this. This is what uh, this is what Bobby says in his message. He says, shout out to Ethan Anastas, and I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, at Cornerstone Prep for guarding the jots and tw- tittles. All right. Well, there you go. If you want a message read on uh, a live program, 
uh, feel free, become a, an executive producer, and uh, we would be happy to read something for you. Now, let's see here. Um, let's see here. What do I want to play? Hmm. Let's do... Sorry, give me just a... Oh, I like this one. See, our, our soundboard is just not utilized enough. And uh, so here we go. That's what I do. I drink and I know things. Yeah, well, that's all I got for now. <laughs> uh, Sponsored by Ace Religion Supply, where they say, if we don't got it, it ain't holy. <laughs> we do not get a lot of humor here, and when we do, it's wonderful. All right, there you go. You've Thank been you much, blessed. Mr. Bond, for your executive producership. Okay. Um, now that all of that has uh, has been done, and Bobby is in the chat room, so thank you. Um, okay, so now that all of that has been done, let's go to uh, and thank you to all of our producers, by the way. Let's uh, let's also say if you want to support the show, you can do so um, just by buying a mug or becoming a supporter. You can also be a part of this conversation, 253-465-3205. It's 253-465-3205. We'll play the jingle for you as I bring up our email address on the screen. Messiah Matters wants to hear from you. Leave us a comment, a question or two. Call 253-465-3205. Okay. Caleb, so, Caleb I, I've been uh, mischievous. Uh oh, because uh, this is show three ninety one. Okay, I thought you know, let's just let's just do a gematria of that. Uh oh, okay. No, it's actually it's actually good. Uh, Proverbs three six: Bechol trachecha daehu. In all your paths, acknowledge him. In Hebrew, that uh, if you add up those letters, it's three ninety one. All right, there you go. For those who have not been with us for a long time. For those who care. <laughs> Somebody said that my uh, my soundboard was super loud. Okay, I've turned it down significantly. Okay, let's jump into this. I want to I want to go. I want to go on this, and I want to go That's right good, away. That's good, because so, I have hearing damage for years of rock and roll. <laughs> That's right, and the mullet, the mighty mullet. That's that's Rob's second uh, uh, name on the show. The for mighty MM, mullet. yeah. The, yes, MM, the mighty mullet. Okay. Um, so last week we talked about the Trinity. We talked about the deity of Christ and the Trinity. And the question was asked, is this something that we as believers can agree to disagree on? There are a lot of people in the Hebrew Roots movement, the Torah movement at large, the Messianic movement, whatever you want to say, who are rejecting core doctrines, particularly particularly in the Hebrew Roots movement. And one of these doctrines, obviously, is the Trinity, let alone the deity of Christ. So uh, I think that both of these are just as important. I think that the Trinity is just as important as the deity of Christ. Many people disagree with that. Mostly the people who disagree with that deny the Trinity, neither here nor there. Um, anyway, not the point. So uh, what was said last week, and I have linked the short video that I clipped in the description of our YouTube video this week. You can go and watch that. I think it's five or six minutes. What we said last week was this is an issue that is non-negotiable. If a person doesn't believe in the Trinity, they should not be a member of our churches. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just kick them out. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, there needs to be the ability for people who are inerrant uh, theology to be able to hear the truth of the gospel. I believe that. And so uh, at the congregation that I pastored for several years, uh, we had several people who denied the Trinity and we had um, some of the, I, some of those same people denied the deity of Christ. Uh, yeah, and yeah. that was, that was a problem. It was a, a problem, but uh, uh, so my, my, uh, what I'm saying here is not, Hey, get the pitchforks and the, uh, and the, you know, the torches and let's go burn them down. No, that's not what I'm saying. But the conversation that ensued last week was basically to say that, no, this is not negotiable. And the conversation that uh, took place on that video, there's 63 comments currently on that video. Uh, all of them, except for me and one other person are anti-Trinitarian. And Basically, uh, there are two main things that have been said in the comments, and those main things are, I've seen no scriptural reference that we have to believe that Yeshua or Jesus is yod heh vav -Hey I, for salvation. I have a question for you on that. Okay. Can I interrupt? Of course. Or, do you, or am I interrupting midstream here? Nope. Keep I, going. Okay. Well, I'll just read you a verse. 
Caleb, and you, yeah. you tell me what you think. So in first Peter three, it says, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And it, then it says, do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. And here he's actually citing Isaiah, Isaiah, uh, the prophet. And he says, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. And keep, and this is verse 16, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts is Peter's reiterating, he's, he's citing the prophet Isaiah where, where it has yod heh in your hearts. Right, right. So if I say I'm a believer in Jesus, and I believe the Bible, and I believe Peter is one of the apostles, and that I believe this is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Right. And how, how, how do I sanctify another person who's not God in my heart? As yod heh And actually, Yeah, how do I fulfill of- this? How do I fulfill this? In my life, if 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 Jesus is just a man, okay. So so two things on this. First of all, um, this is actually one of the comments that was made was that you know I I quoted several verses to uh, several people in the chat in the in the chat on this video, and the response was "Kurios" can just mean Lord or Master. Now I have a response to that as well. However, in in the passage that you just cited, he is quoting from Isaiah. And so we know that that the word kurios here does not just mean Lord or Master. It means yod heh because that's what it says in the It means the, the Messiah is yod heh in the flesh. Yeah, exactly. So, so, okay, let's just say, oh, okay, kurios can mean man, which is true. It can be referred to just a man. How, am I, how is it biblical in alignment with the Torah to sanctify as holy another human in my heart? And so, it's in your hearts. This is plural. This this is Peter writing to the ecclesia. They're all to do this. So that means in the body of Messiah, then you have two groups of people. You have the people that believe that this is that there's no difference in terms of uh, of their worship because they see God as triune. So there's no conflict here. And then there's the people that are like, well, they have to add this footnote. Well, he's not God though. Well, okay, so what are you doing sanctifying another person in your heart? That's that's weird. That's a right. weird claim in my well, view. Okay, so so we're going to we're going to expand on that view in just a second. Before we do, I want to get to uh Lois's comment in the chat room. She says, "Are you defining not believing in the Trinity as the same thing as denial, which might actually be a result of lack of information or bad teaching?" Now, I agree with this. Those who know my walk uh, and my coming to Christ, know that one of the first things that I did was uh, strongly test the uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. My father and I went round and round for you know several years on this, and I skirted, I danced a little bit with the idea of binitarianism, and uh, I I never denied. And Caleb is a darn good dancer, <clears throat> by the way. Thank you. Uh, but in the end, I had to admit that there was there was more there. So so and that the Trinity was a, a true doctrine according to the Bible. With that said, I'm not saying that a person who, you know, there are people who are solid believers, probably uh, you know, closer to the Lord than I am, who uh, who live in huts in Africa, who have no theological training, who truly trust in the Lord and have no understanding of the theological implications of what the Bible says. They simply believe in God. Does that mean that they're not saved because they don't know the word Trinity or because they haven't hashed out this theology? Of course, the answer is no. But when we look at the comments in our on this video, people are saying that, and this is one that always gets me. Uh, you know, somebody said, "Oh, it's it's the Roman Catholic Church." You know, it's a, a doctrine of the Trinity, which is a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. First of all, the the Trinity, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was not around when the Trinity doctrine uh, was formed as how they, in terms of them being able to speak about it in the way that they were speaking about it. Uh, so, and somebody 
cited the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea was before the, the Roman Catholic Church came into existence, in my opinion. So anyway, the, not according there's, to the Romans. Yeah, there is a difference. Be, there is a difference between outright denial of the the deity of Christ and the doctrine of the Trinity, and those who simply are uh, maybe unaware, or those who have uh, ha- don't have knowledge of things, and the, even those who question things. I have no problem if a person wants to say, "Well, is is Yeshua really uh, Yod Hey Vav in the flesh? How do we see that?" Let's explore the scriptures and see if we actually see that. I have no problem with that I, because I think that questions like that actually are healthy. They help people come closer to the truth. However, uh, those who have come to an under their understanding that Yeshua is not yod heh vav are not being honest with the text. There's two options here. Either you believe that Yeshua is yod heh vav in the flesh, or you should reject the New Testament. That's all there is to it. There's, there's two options. And if you're, yeah, so, if you true. try to say that there's another option, you're just not being honest with the text. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go to some of these. So the, the first there's, there's, there were two main comments throughout the entire thread. And that was number one, uh, you haven't provided any, any biblical, uh, backing for the notion that, uh, someone has to believe that Yeshua is yod heh vav in the flesh. Rob already did that with one passage. We'll do it with more. The I'll second, do it. I'll, the, yeah, hang on. the The second criticism was that uh, we should that I said, and this is me. I I put this on me. I said that a person who doesn't believe that Yeshua is a deity does not have the Spirit. Now I will retract this and say that uh, I am not the person who should be determining. Praise the Lord! I am not the person who determines who has the Spirit and who does not. That is not. That is not up to me, and I retract Eeny, that. Meeny, miny, mo. Yeah, exactly. I so um, you know, and I think of people like and Rob and I were talking before we came came on air. I think of people like Aaron and uh, the golden calf incident. Now, I, my point here is simply that uh, God is the is the one who chooses. You know, it, it, Aaron worship creates a false god for Israel uh, at Mount Sinai. Now. We could talk at length about other instances as well. Does this mean that Aaron didn't have the the spirit? Once again, it's, I'm not the judge of this. I'm not the one who's going to determine that, and I don't want to be. So I retract my I, re, I certainly retract my statement that a person who doesn't believe the Yeshua is deity doesn't have the spirit of God because I think that people can change, and I think that people uh, and I think that the Lord is the one who determines whether or not He gives His spirit. However, let's look at the. With that said, let's look at the scriptural basis for why a person has to believe in that. So people said there's no, there's nowhere where it says you have to believe that Yeshua is yod heh vav Okay. Well, Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is kurios, here once again, we have this word kurios and the, the comments push back and this is, oh no, this is, this can just mean Lord or master and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Okay. We have another one. I uh, John eight twenty four. Oh, I told wait, wait, you. finish that, finish that though, because doesn't he cite Joel then? All who believe, uh, on, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10. in Romans nine. Is that Romans 9? It's Romans 10, 9. Because if you or confess Romans. with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord, Kurios, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For and the then, scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no right. distinction between Jew and Greek. Right. And so that the that's another reference, and we, we have the same thing. Well, it's Romans 10, 13. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He's he's quoting Joel, and that's yod heh vav heh. Right, yeah. That's, it, that's, it, that Paul, Paul and Peter. We've shown Paul and we've shown Peter. I can show James. Go ahead. You were going to do John. You do John first. Well, it, Yeshua, right? Yeshua in um, in John eight twenty eight eight twenty four. Now we often quote John eight fifty six. Is it fifty six or fifty eight? Anyway, the, the before Abraham was, I am. Was I am right? Yeah, that's an uh, awesome one. That's awesome. John. Then John like, oh, it doesn't mean what you think it means. I'm like, yeah. Give me so a break. They John eight twenty four though. This is the, this is the precursor to John eight fifty eight. He says in John eight twenty four, I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am, ego a me, you will die in your sins. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. blatant. Um, 
Philippians 2, 9, 3, 11. Now, this one doesn't say you have to believe. However, uh, I have... Let, Let's just go with this for a second, okay? So Philippians, therefore God has exalted, has highly exalted him, that is Yeshua, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Yeshua every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Yeshua, uh, that Jesus Christ is kurios to the, the glory of God the Father. Now he's, he is quoting from Isaiah 45, 23. Once again, we're talking about yod heh here in Isaiah 45, 23. No, and so uh, those who say, well, kurios can just mean Lord or Master, Yeshua responds to this too. In Luke 16, 13, he says, no servant can, ha- can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and de- uh, despise the other. So what you're saying is we have two masters. We have yod heh the Father in heaven, and now I know that the Luke passage is talking about money, but... The, the 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 statement it's, it's applies. It's making a theological point. Yeah. Yeah, and the theological point is is that those who deny that Yeshua is Yod Heh Vav Heh are saying, well, Yeshua is just our master. So Yod Heh Vav Heh is our master, and Yeshua is our master, and Yeshua himself says, no servant can serve two masters. So even if, which I would never give a person, even if the word kurios does not mean Yod Heh Vav Heh in the plethora of of passages that we have already cited, and there are more that we could, even if that was the case, which it's not, but even if that's the case, you still have a major theological issue because Yeshua cannot be kurios, master or Lord, if yod heh vav heh is master and Lord. You cannot serve two masters. So yeah, I, yeah. It, it, and it, that goes, that reminds me also of James chapter one, where he says, I, you know, this is James servant of God, the father and Yeshua, the Messiah. Like he's a servant of both. And that, and that is, that flies in the face of, of people who, you know, they have to be, it's one in the same will. There's no, there's no, there's no difference in terms of, are serving God. We, we, we can't separate. We, you can't think of Yeshua apart from the Father. You can't think of the Father apart from Yeshua. They, we, we have the full revelation. But also, why would his own brother in James chapter 2 call him the Lord of glory? Okay, this is his little brother. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, the Lord of glory. That's it's a different kind of relationship than my older brother and I had. That's for yeah. Sure. You know the people. It, I'm I'm not sure what it is. You know why people want to. You know people want to kick against I mean, that, and they're the, going to have the chat, to. They're going to have to come to some some doing some twister explanations of. And 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 the chat room is helping us out here. The John 17 project says when Matthew is quoting Isaiah and clearly calls Yeshua Emmanuel. It always seemed clear to me. If he is God with us, then do they think he is another God? Exactly. Brandon says, 1 Tim- Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen among of angels, pr- preached unto the mm-hmm. Gentiles, believed on yeah. in the world. And Caleb, is your, in, I'm not saying this is in every case, but in one of the the arenas where I've seen this downplayed, the deity of Yeshua, is in the, quote, messianic Jewish movement that are trying to cuddle up with the Orthodox. Yeah, absolutely. And they're trying to bring in rabbinic garb to dress the gospel up. Yeah, I agree, but but I also think... But I know, but there's also another side of that where they are in the more Chabad-influenced Right. Where they're going to say, well, they said Schneerson is, he is who he is. You know, they right. use this kind of language to say, you know, they're not denying. They think that he is uh, God. Right. Um, but of course, they're just taking, now that's just total, total hijacking of the gospel message and doing dress up on a Hasidic rabbi, you know, yep. who had a stroke and died and is buried in Brooklyn and they visit his grave and put letters on his grave every day uh yeah he ain't risen the tomb of my my rabbi is empty 
Okay, let's exactly. let's move Boom. on. I we got we got a lot to get here too, uh, and so I want to shift gears completely. Hey, I haven't said this yet, but uh, for those who are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do us a huge favor: subscribe now. If you are subscribed, subscribe do, already. Do us your own favor, and if you're already subscribed, go ahead and click that like button, that thumbs up. That helps. Share, us too. share with a friend. Yeah, share. Oh, share with an enemy. Sharing is caring. Sharing sure. is caring. All right. Uh, don't forget to subscribe. Okay, here we go. We're going to move on to uh, Nelda Bell. Uh, she, every single uh, message that we've gotten from Nelda has been uh, a pretty, pretty darn good one. And uh, this is no exception. No exception at all. Nelda writes in, Nelda Bell writes in, she says, is the institution of church membership scriptural? I can understand the principle as far as determining the overseers. But are we a democracy where people are voted in? If someone chooses to attend a fellowship and is there consistently and expresses a desire to participate more in the actual teaching within the body, does that then not become a discussion between overseers and that person to determine their belief and whether they are walking in line with the Torah? Thanks. Okay, so I, I want to. I want to. I'll take this first because uh, I I wrestled with this one for a really long time and. Let's first say this, that we don't see anywhere in the scripture where it talks about a person becoming a member of a congregation in terms of like, and then they, be, and then they signed, you know, then they stood up and became members or, you know, then they took the, the members class and, uh, and they were considered members. We don't see that obviously. So, um, anything that we would talk about in terms of church membership, uh, has to be implied. It's not, you know, like many things. In the scriptures, I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying it's you're not going to find the smoking gun verse. With that said, uh, Nelda Bell talks about the idea of leadership, and this is a huge part of a congregation. In fact, in Hebrews, a, leaders are said to uh, be to watch the soul or to protect the souls of the congregants. And what does that mean to guard the souls? So anyway, there is a there is an element here where uh, that that we need to be aware of. And what I came to in my studies is this: what we see a lot, especially in the Torah movement, people get uh, frustrated, or they will get upset, or they will be straight up kicked out of a church, and that hurts. It always hurts to be rejected by the body of of Christ. Um, and so there's a bitterness that oftentimes goes uh, along with that. P and what people tend to do is they tend to say, I'm not going to put myself under the leadership. You know, leadership at churches has been bad before. So I'm not going to put myself under the leadership of, of another, of another pastor or elder. And so what they do is they become kind of what we call lone wolves and they will go, they'll kind of bounce from congregation to congregation. Maybe they have three or four that they like, they'll just kind of pop in whenever, and what this does is it takes away the entire institution of church discipline. which And I think that church discipline is a vital part of the body of Christ. And so the only way that church discipline works is if we as the congregants have made the commitment that the person, the people, it should be people, the people that are running or in charge of watching over the souls of the congregants, we have put ourselves under their spiritual authority. Now, does that mean that you have to take a class? No, not necessarily. However, different different congregations do it differently. And so I think that it is important to place ourselves under the spiritual authority of elders and leaders within a congregation. And I think that that is a biblical thing to do. And I think that people who are not willing to do that tend to uh, get into trouble because they are essentially, they're wiggling their way out of church discipline. And that is a major problem. So do I think that that uh, church membership is biblical? I think the answer is yes. I think it's biblical because what it does when we become church members or when we become a member of a congregation is it, what we're saying is I place myself under the spiritual authority of the elders here. That's what I think. Rob? I, I have a similar view. I think that our we're told in scripture that if you're born from above, you are a member of the body. Right. And that is the, that's not different than being justified by faith. And, and we know that, as it says in scripture, that God raises up, you know, some prophets, some evangelists, I'm thinking Ephesians and other passages, some teachers, um, 
that he raises up different um, leaders and, and there's different um, roles and responsibilities that God shapes individuals into, but th- that shaping and development of the new creation believers in this world is not done in a cave. It's not done in isolation. It's done in close relationship with other believers. And that means learning and knowing that there's a whole history of believers that went before us that lived full lives in service to the Lord and died before we were ever on the planet. And um, we are, when you become a, a believer, you you're brought into that history. That history is now your history. The, the wisdom that is preserved among the elders is now your inheritance, right? And, and, but without relationship, there's, you're only going to be able to grow a tiny, tiny bit, if at all. You've got to have a, a system you got to be that system. I don't like the word system. You got to be in, in, you got to be connected. You got to be connected to other believers. And in that connection is the growth because you're going to hear where you need, because if someone, it doesn't even have to be a pastor in that regard. It, like in Galatians six, where it says, if you, you know, if you see someone who's trapped in sin, you who are, Spiritual, go and be careful. Watch yourself, lest you too be tempted. Right? It's it is mutual edification, mutual correction, mutual. That is the second greatest commandment, because the love that we are commanded to love for one another is also inseparable from the the mandate to bring correction. That is to bring words of Torah, to bring words of the living God as the forefront governing principle between in our relationships. But our love of Yeshua, like we talked about last week, is not so. We're never going to have a corrective word for Yeshua. We're the corrected right. in that relationship. That's a one way. That's why our love for Yeshua falls under, like Caleb so correctly said last week, falls under the command to love the Lord your God, not the command to love your neighbors yourself. So the people who this is back to the earlier thing, you know, people are saying that Yeshua is just a man, then that means you cannot, you're not loving him according to the first commandment, which means your love is faulty. You do not even know how to love Yeshua. That's, that's what I say. But anyway, back to the point of membership. I, I see myself first and foremost as a member of the body of Messiah. And I have an obligation thereof um, to hear and receive correction from different avenues um, and also, you know, to try to help other people as well. You know, I, um, and I see that that's, that's the core, you know, uh, growth process for, for believers in Yeshua, but the people who are the floaters, what I call floaters, the people who bounce around and yeah, I think there is, there's an avoidance, there's an avoidance. And I've seen that I've been in, in the messianic world long enough to know and recognize the avoidance that per- people, it people use it to protect themselves. Yeah. You can spot it a mile away too. And, they don't and, ha- that way that, you, they don't have to be, it's like, well, we just have to agree to disagree. Let's, and, and let's be real, real clear here. I'm not necessarily putting those people down. A lot of the time, the people who need, uh, need a community the most are the people who try to avoid community. And the reason why yeah, is I think because there's hurt, there's hurt, there's, there's, there's hurt. hurt. They've yeah. been burned, that kind of stuff. And so there needs to be a lot of love and, and a lot of understanding with that, those kind of people. Let's get, jump into the chat room. There's a lot that has been said here. <clears throat> and Jake says, what if church membership means accepting all of said church's doctrine? I have not, I personally have not been to a church uh, in my area, where becoming a church member means that you have to accept things that uh, would not be uh, would not be theological. What I'm trying to say here is, uh, most of the uh, churches that I've been to that I think are biblically uh, on track in in their fundamentals would make you agree with the fundamental doctrines. 
things like the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the 66 book canon, maybe the five solas, things like that. Um, even the Presbyterian church where I have visited from time to time, um, and they are, they're the robe Presbyterians. I don't even know what press, what kind of Presbyterian that is, but, but the guys up front have the robes on, right? I mean, yeah, going all the way here. They don't even make you agree that, that pedo baptism is, is, uh, you know, part of their church membership. That's not, that's not part of it. So, um, I'm sure it's out there. I'm not saying it's not out there. I'm just saying that most of the churches that I have, that I have visited and, uh, been a part of do not require a, you have to agree with everything that we believe to be a member. That's, I've never seen that. Um, once again, I think it's out there, but I, but I've never seen it. Uh, we have another, uh, in light of your comments about membership is why, okay, uh, we can't edify each other and keep each other accountable if we aren't part of a local congregation. Sorry, I'm just kind of reading through some of these. Where was the one? Um, uh, oh, John, thank you. The John 17 Project. I have been encountering this attitude of separating from other believers as pronomian Christians, which I think is understandable, but ultimately wrong. What do you think about building walls like that? So, this is where I think a lot of people who are attempting to use the title pronomian uh, and pronomian Christian are really going askew. And what I mean by that is pronomian is not a, it's not a movement. It's not a, it's not anything, it's not a sect. It's not a new, uh, you know, movement or I don't know what you want to say. It's none of that. It's just simply a, a theology in the Rolodex. And so to say that a pronomian Christian should separate from other Christians is does not align with such a title. What I mean by that is that would be like me saying, oh, well, you know, I'm not pedo baptist so I'm going to separate from, you know, I'm going to make pa- non pedo baptism a entire sect to itself. And we're not going to associate with any Christian who doesn't believe in that. So those who are attempting to use the term pronomian Christian as a sect, and uh, here's the other thing, I don't want to... I'll probably offend a lot of people doing this, but a lot of the people who are trying to make the name pronomian and, and pronomian Christian its own like movement, really what they're trying to do is rebrand the Hebrew roots movement. And that's okay. I understand that. In fact, I, I kind of think that's good. It needs good. <laughs> yeah. The Hebrew roots movement <laughs> certainly needs to be rebranded. There's no I like, I like it. just pro Bible and pro Bible, pro Bible and pro Boblian. So I'm not, once again, I'm not trying to put people down who are trying to rebrand the Hebrew Roots Movement, but ultimately they're doing that because the Hebrew Roots Movement has such a bad name. And so it's understandable that they'd want to do that. However, you can't just take a theological position, like a theological understanding within the Rolodex of theology and say, we're going to make that our, uh, the, new, the new movement instead of the Hebrew Roots Movement. That doesn't work. Um, so it's, yeah. Uh, Gilberto says, your thoughts on theonomy. That's an entire show. We're not going to get into that right now. Um, okay, let's, so I hope that that answers Nelda Bell's question. Let's, uh, let's move on. Let's see here. We have some time, but I think that this might take some time. We'll, okay. Brandon, who is in the chat room, uh, sent, sent this, uh, this message. He says, now he, he quoted, a significant portion of Acts 21. His his real question is on Acts 21:25. Now, I'm not going to read Acts 21:25 until I'm done with the entire message which he wrote. And that is this. He says in Acts 21 when James confronts Paul due to the rumor going around that he is teaching the Jews among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and not circumcise their children nor keep the customs and the law. James asks Paul to take up what seems to be the Nazarite vow to show the Jews he walks in accordance with the law. Pause. I would actually disagree with that. I think that uh, in what is it 18 or 19 he fulfills a Nazarite vow when he's in Ephesus. And he does that by shaving. Um, and I don't know why he, I don't know why he would fulfill it there and not in Jerusalem, but for some reason it seems as though he fulfills a vow, which seems to be a Nazarite vow. Most commentators agree that this is a Nazarite vow. Some, some say that he took some kind of a pagan vow to show that he was free in Christ. I totally reject that. Not the point, but he gets back to Jerusalem and I think that he's going to go to the temple to do the, the sacrificial part of the of the uh, vow which he completed in Ephesus. And I think that James says to him, look, take these guys too. It's going to show that you're sincere. So anyway, 
minor point, not at all what Brandon's getting at. Anyway, let's keep going with Brandon's comment. It says, in this passage, the context doesn't seem to be alluding to anything about what needs to be done to be saved, like we see in Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Council, but simply that the law should be kept by the Jews. But then we see the same guidelines laid out in verse 25 for the Gentiles as in Acts 15.29. This is a very interesting passage. What then is Acts 21.25 speaking to? Why does James interject the statement of, and this is where it gets really interesting, as touching the Gentiles which be, which believe we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication, end quote. That they observe no such thing in, in contrast to what? He wasn't talking about being saved by keeping the law, only that the law should be be kept by the Jews. So what, therefore, do we make of this? Okay, let's read Brandon's translation of this uh, passage. His translation in Acts 21-25 says, As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication. As soon as I read this, I had a sneaking suspicion that uh, Brandon was using a translation that uh, I would not use. And so I went and looked, and sure enough, uh, we're, it seems, I, I'm not, I would guess that this might be KJV or New King James. Uh, this, is, this is the product of a later text. Rob, would you like to take over at this point? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the manuscripts, this is a, what we call a scribal edition. And the parallel, it, we, we see it where a, a, a scribe changed also not just Acts 21 here, added added this line, but also in Acts 15. Um, and so the question is, well, hey, how do you evaluate this if you have manuscripts that are different from one another? Well, first of all, they're very late. Uh, but but aside from that, someone could make the argument that, the, you know, well, just because it's late doesn't mean it that it's a newer text or a newer copy doesn't mean that that it's not original. So you have to then explain, well, if it's original, why was it eliminated then um, in, in much earlier manuscripts? Not only that, it's those earlier manus manuscripts that were translated into other languages like Latin and the Syriac. So in other words, we have an earlier text tradition that does not have the uh, observe no such thing phrase except and not only that it, it's earlier but it it's that earlier tradition that went into latin and aramaic so that was the the earlier that's how we know it's the earlier tradition it was a later uh scribe uh copying the greek that added this and of course when they added in the greek the fact that it's already out in the world in in, yeah. in the syriac latin and already and out in the syriac. world in latin can't be <laughs> they don't, they're not aware of that. Right. They can't undo it. They can't. Yeah. Undo you it can't it. undo it. Uh, it. It's obvious. I, I, I don't think there's any translation in the last hundred years aside from maybe a, just a revised King James that has that. Okay. I mean, are there any, are there any translations now in the, you know, even 20th century that, have the reading that he's using. Um, I actually don't know what he didn't leave a, uh, a translation, you know, what translation he was using, but I just assumed it has to be KJV um, and the Texas Receptus is what I, is yeah, what yeah, I that, assumed. That, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, this would be, this is the kind of question that Dr. Daniel Wallace would, would be able to probably really give a, a nice, concise answer. I did. I did my best. Well, the, the ultimately, not only that, but the, the translation that uh, is cited here, uh, there is a theological reason why a scribe would put this in. By the time yeah. the scribe, yeah. by the by the time the, the the scribe puts it in, there is a fight over whether or not the uh, the church should be keeping the Torah or not. That's exactly right. There's a historical. So when when we look at all these lanes of traffic together. And we look at that. We look at the history as a whole. 
this is this is what happens with texts. You know, texts get modified over time. This is why if you compare, I mean, if just set aside the apostolic writings and look just at the Tanakh, look at the copies of the Bible from Qumran and look at the Masoretic tradition. Right. And the Masoretic tradition, we, oops, we, we have a, a real solid tradition back into the first century, but you see the, the text traditions of the Torah and the prophets that we find from Qumran have all sorts of variations brought in. Because they they believed also, remember Qumran believed, this is a side footnote, but they believed in this, in that they had a prophetic role, like that they could modify scripture because they had the authority to do so. Whereas the scribes in Jerusalem were like, you can't, you can't change scripture. You know, right. you, you can't just say, hey, everybody, I know we've all, I know our fathers and our father's fathers and our father's 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 scribes have always copied it this way, but I think we're going to. But I'm yeah, going to okay, change well, it right here. Yeah, I'm going to change this word. That doesn't um, mean the Masoretic text is is perfect, uh, because it's you know. But but anyway, that's a side. That's a I, side I did I did a little a very little bit of d- digging to see uh, what scholars accept. I was going to ask you about that dirt under your fingernails. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Yep. Caleb. Uh, I I uh, <laughs> I did a little bit of digging to see what scholars accept the later reading. Oh, and I could find none. I'm sure there's probably a scholar out there, but I have not found one. Well, the King all James of, only scholars will. Oh, uh, sure. All, who's all the, of who's the, the guy that uh, a couple like a couple of years ago? It might have been all the way back to when it was Robin Caleb's show. There was a King James only guy that we had interacted with. Do you remember? Oh, Johnson. A, was there a Steve, Thompson or a Johnson or? A, it was Stephen. Uh, yeah, in the. Uh, Anyway, in Arizona. Okay. Anyway, he uh, he Gil- probably he probably is. Gilberto writes and says, or it could be a mistake. It, this is not a mistake. Uh, there's ways. No, that it's, there's it, yeah. It's, w- it's in terms of in terms of te- textual criticism. We can we uh, textual criticism is an extremely interesting field, and it's one that is beyond my my understanding in terms of how you know when I was really looking into Codex Beza. Seeing how they determined, you know, uh, this scribe was right-handed, this scribe was left-handed, this scribe came from Lyon, this scribe came, and this scribe didn't. And the way that they knew that was... I like how un- you say Lyon. It was fascinating. Uh-oh, my my camera just turned off. Um, That's Your camera did not like the way you said Lyon. Yeah, exactly. Uh, do I have another camera laying around? I probably do. Should I turn it on? Yeah, probably. Just give us like a, uh, you know, I don't know. Doing some sort of jujitsu move or something. <laughs> uh, um, give me just one second here. I don't know why this keeps happening to me, but it does. So give me just one second. Caleb, that's I like the sound of the mic. It sounds like he's away in the corner. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, I'm usually uh Okay, just let I'm sorry. Caleb lead here. Okay. My, my my audio, hang on just a sec. Let me uh let me just get a camera up here real quick. <laughs> If I can. Okay. There's my Elgato face cam. I apologize, everyone. Last week, now last week, it, this worked just fine, didn't it? And this week, it did It For some reason, it didn't like it. There was a couple weeks ago, it went blank. That's right. Yeah, two weeks ago, I think. Um, so anyway, um, as I'm talking... <clears throat> The the point here is that no the the um, the scribes can the scribes can determine what exactly is you know like uh, whether or not there is a mistake like a, a scribe missed a line or something or whether or not they you know but this is blatant and what I mean by blatant is that it like obviously there's no there's no other text that says this so it's it's pretty obvious that somebody added something. And what we mean by what, what we assume happens is that he had a thought theological position that he wanted to implant into the text. It's essentially what he did. Okay. Can you not see me? It doesn't matter. We're almost done. Who cares? Um, okay. So, uh, we have one last thing that we can talk about and let's do that real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, where am, oh yeah, you can't see me here. I'll read this to you. You take over on this and then, uh, you take this and then we'll, uh, 
Yeah, I'll fix my camera for you. Yeshua, this is, the person did not leave a name. If you're going to leave a comment, please leave your name. It's always nice. This person did not leave a name. They say this. They say, Yeshua did not sin. He was the unblemished lamb. He was in the wilderness for 40 days. <clears throat> he certainly was not congregating, <clears throat> excuse me, congregating on those Sabbaths. I've heard you say that it is a command to congregate, and I have read it uh, too in the Bible. So is it that our understanding or congreg congregating on congregating is wrong, or because he is Yeshua, it is different? And if that is the case, what does it mean for uh, the experience uh, for him, that he experienced what it was to be human? And go. I'm not sure I understand the question. So is, in other it, words, is this the question that Yeshua was 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness? Therefore, he didn't go to church or go to synagogue? Yes. And therefore, that would be a sin. That's the, that's the question, or that's the, the line of thought. Well, I, I, you could say the same thing of John the Baptist or Elijah. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. So I would say this. I would say that the command to congregate is it, it's it should be the norm but it's not a sin if you are sick right to miss synagogue or miss church and not get everyone else you know if you got the covid stay home right so it's but they're going to say yeshua was didn't have covid no, but he had. Like, other, I don't think they didn't have a he, word for it back then. He, he had. He had other. Per, he had other things that he was doing, right? Important things that he had to do, and so the point is, is that uh, Yeshua had a reg, had the regular tradition. It says, as was his tradition, he made it a regular occurrence that he was part of a congregation, and, and that's that that's con that's what. It, yeah, that's the good place to go and with so, that. That's my. I mean, that's my understanding of it. Uh, Lee Kessler says, uh, for my own uh, research purposes, what would be a place to look for more information about about the church over Torah observance? Um, well, Eusebius talks about it a lot, but then what's the council? Is it the Council of uh, Carthage? No, the Council Council of I forget the Minor Council that that says that. Uh, so the chat room will tell me what's the Minor Council that says that a um, that uh, the church should not celebrate the Sabbath or the festivals. I would I would look there and then go off of the comments from the church fathers on that. Um, ultimately, just a look at the Sabbath. You know, even once you get into the Reformation, the the, the it's interesting because the the festivals are really the place where uh, where you have to look because the church fathers say that you should keep the Sabbath. They just say that it's been moved to Sunday. And they say that those who are trying to congregate on Shabbat on Saturday are Judaizers. And so there's a there's a distinction here. Ultimately, the Catholic Church is the one who uh, tries to steer people towards a, you know, the idea that the, that the Catholic Church is really instituting the Sunday worship. I, I would, ah, yeah, the Council of Laodicea. Thank you, John Seventeen Project, um, the Council of Laodicea. So I would—that's where I would start. I would start at the Council of Laodicea and Eusebius. Eusebius is—you know—he really, and you can almost see a progression too because uh, who is it? Who who was the uh, Melito of Sardis? Melito of Sardis talks about, uh, you know, what seems to be a Passover seder for or a Passover celebration for Christians. Um, so, but there is a—it's a quick. It is a quick move uh, relatively, you know, what a generation maybe, and you have people moving away. Right. Well, um, faith in Yeshua spread faster in the world than knowledge of the Torah. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's all it is. is then people trying to keep up with that. Like John 17 project says the second council of Nicaea adds more to this as well. That is true. The Second Council of Nicaea, where we the Nicaean the Nicaean Creed that we currently have adopted in uh, the Christian faith uh, it comes from the Second Council of Nicaea, not the first. And people are going to say, "Oh, well, the, you know, the first one disagrees with the second one," and that that's actually true. But uh, it's really interesting the history of this as well, and the reason why is because why did it disagree? 
The answer is it disagreed because uh, they were still formulating language. And the first council of Nicaea attempts to use language that the pagans, the uh, you know, the, the Gnostics were using. And the second council of Nicaea, by the time the second council of Nicaea comes around, they say, no, we don't want, we don't want anything to do with that language. In fact, if we use that language, if you use that language, it means you're a heretic. So that whole progression of language is, is super interesting. All right. That's what we got. Uh, so there is a question on whether or not we're going to be around next week. My gut feeling is going to be no. Uh, in fact, I think that we're going to be taking two weeks off. And the reason why is because my family is going to be going on vacation the day after that, uh, early in the morning on the Thursday. And nice. uh, so we got to get our house sitter all situated and we got to get all, you know everything kind of put in order. Uh, and I just don't know if I'm going to. And, and here's the big one. Here's the kicker. I am launching pronomian.com on, on July 17th, which is the, like the day after we get back. And so I basically have to have the whole thing ready before we leave. Um, I can work on it a little bit on vacation, but my family's not going to want me sitting at a computer typing. So uh, right off the bat, you have to defend, you have to define why it's not a movement. Like you come out that you have to come out of a gate, like, right. Trying to clarify. A misunderstanding. Yeah, I've 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 actually asked uh, my good friend Jeff Young to write an article on that since he's the one who kind of sparked the the use of the name Pronomian. Uh, I've asked him to write on that. Now, nice. My good friend Jeff, who probably will never hear this because he's just so busy, is just so busy. So whether or not he actually writes that article, um, that's a whole another thing to be seen. So, yeah. Hey, uh, so thank you very much to the chat room. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. You guys are just awesome. And uh, I don't think we could do this show anymore without you guys. We tried in the beginning and it was subpar at best. Um, We're getting we close have... to show 400. That's pretty yeah. cool. That is pretty cool. Because so. I think we changed from Rob, Rob, Rob and Caleb to Messiah, Messiah, Messiah Matter. Sorry for the stutter there. At show 200. Was that right? Did yeah, we do? Yeah. Yep. Show right. 200 was the first Messiah Matters. Yep. That's right. So Bobby K, maybe, says, Bobby K says 18 days, 14, 15 hours and 34 minutes. I put up a countdown on the pronomian.com for the launch date. So yes, yeah, so you can go and count down with, uh, with pronomian. All right. Count down with Caleb. Count down with Caleb. Woo-hoo! I like it. That, that has a ring to it. Yeah, I'm trying to get some stuff going. And actually, for those who don't know, I interviewed um, Leighton Flowers. I interviewed Leighton Flowers. It was probably the worst interview I've ever done in my life. But I was all over the place. My camera actually fritzed out in the middle of it as well. Um, mm-hmm. But the uh, the point here is that uh, that interview with Leighton Flowers will drop on July 11th as well. So it's uh, And you will be able to watch that on my personal YouTube channel, uh, which I have posted somewhere. But I'll post it again. Anyway, okay. Well, everybody, it's been fun. It's been real. We hope that this conversation has done at least one thing, and that is to glorify our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. Why? You know why. Because Messiah Messiah matters. matters.